Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this edition of Shop Talk. Uh, today, we're going to be starting to focus on the weather changing. I had to cover my chilies out back in the backyard in my garden last night because the temperature dipped low enough that I need to keep concerns about frost. And uh, as we get ready for the snow to fly, um, there's a lot of work that many of us need to focus on. And so today I have asked Todd Roth from the Center Region Parks and Recreation Authority uh, to share some of his expertise. And so we would like to focus a couple of our learning objectives today is learning proper closure and winterization processes for outdoor pools. Uh, we're gonna learn proper seasonal maintenance, things to consider. And we also wanna think about those, some of those important preparations to ensure efficient reopening next season. Because of course, we're not just shutting down. We always want to think about reopening next year. And so today we've invited Todd Roth, as I said, from Center, Regions Park, <clears throat> Center Region Parks and Recreation Authority. Um, Todd has been uh, working as the aquatic supervisor at Center Region since for 18 years. And he has been working in the aquatics field since 1990. Um, he frequently teaches courses in the state of Pennsylvania and nationally for many organizations uh, focusing on aquatic operations and management. Todd also coaches swimming and water polo and he enjoys Spartan racing. So without further ado, I would like to hand it off to Todd. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, BK. Um, I had a really good COVID joke to tell you guys today. The problem is it would take you two weeks to get it. No, but I will say the, the best kind of jokes you should tell during a pandemic, of course, are inside jokes. All right, so today we're talking about uh, swimming pool closing and winterization. Get my slides to advance here. So here are the things that I want to talk about today. First, I just want to cover, you know, what are our goals when we're winterizing? Um, and go through some of that. And then I'm gonna kind of go step by step around the facility. We'll, do, we'll take a look in the pump room, take a look at your pool body, talk about the, the stuff you might have on your pool deck. Um, we'll touch on some specialized features and equipment. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll stop in the bathhouse for a little bit. And then talk about maybe some things you should be doing throughout the winter, even for a, um, a seasonal pool, so. If you have questions, we have kind of a small group today. So if you do have questions, uh, you can either unmute and just ask. I, you know, there's only a couple of us here today. I think that'd be okay to, to ask that way. Or you can uh, type them in the chat. And if I don't see them, BK, I'll ask you to kind of keep an eye on the chat box and, and uh, interrupt me if we have any, uh, any questions that come up, so. But. All right, so our goals for today my slides will advance here, hang on, advance, there we go. Um, so first of all, let's talk about what is your goal for winterization shutdown? Like BK said, our goal by shutting our pools down is to be ready to reopen them next year. Everything you should do when you're winterizing, you should really be focused on making your life as easy as possible in the spring. Um, you know, protecting your equipment so that you can open easily next year. Um, you know, avoiding freezing uh, or thaw damage, again, so you can have an easy opening for the next year. So um, just kind of whatever you're doing, make sure you're keeping that goal in mind as you're winterizing. Always read and understand your manufacturer's recommendations. Every piece of equipment's a little bit different. Um, some of the things we'll go through, um, there might be tweaks for the specific equipment that you have. So just make sure you understand recommendations for everything you have. Have a checklist. I'm finding more and more as I get older and older, I need to rely on my checklist more and more. Of course, if you're anything like me, you have a nice, really detailed checklist that goes through everything, and then you forget where you put it. You, <laughs> you put it down somewhere in your pool, and you're like, where the heck did my checklist go? So have a checklist, and then know where it's at. As you work through your checklist, make a note 
of anything in your facility that might need service or repair prior to reopening. You know, as you're working through, um, you know, you're working on a pump or something like, man, that doesn't sound good. I should really get that looked at. Or, you know, you find a chunk of concrete in your deck that's missing or a ladder that's loose or something. We'll talk about some of that in a little more detail, but have a place where you can note things that might need service or repair. You, you know, you've got eight or nine months here before you've got to reopen. Take advantage of it while you can. Have a storage system. You're going to have lots of plugs and fittings and equipment and antifreeze and all that stuff to help you winterize. Make sure you have a good system to keep track of everything, um, whether it's a good labeling system or a, a, a good way to store everything for the winter. You want to really make sure that, again, when you uh, de-winterize in the spring, it's a pretty easy process uh, because you're pretty well organized with that. And then understand that every facility is different. Um, every pool I've worked at has had its own uh, idiosyncrasies that we've, you know, I've had to, and I usually put it on my checklist to, hey, remember, this pool is like this. Um, and a lot of the stuff we go through today, some of it might really apply specifically to your facility. Some, some things might be different. So um, just understand the, the differences and, uh, again, be very specific in your checklist on, on what makes your different or special and, and make sure you're really getting through everything that you need to. So, good, any questions before we start in on the pump room? All right, so in general, clean out your chemical lines, okay? Um, if they, if possible, run air or blow air through the, the lines, drain them out, um, try not to leave chemicals or if you flush them out with water or anything, always blow them out afterwards. You don't want to leave um, chemicals in the lines over the winter. So however that works for you, get your chemical lines cleaned out. All right. As you're doing that, make sure you're following all of your safety protocols. All right. Um, have uh, some water or flushing system on hand to, to keep yourself safe. Make sure that um, you're protecting yourself from any fumes that you might encounter. Um, or anything like that. So just make sure you're following all of the um, safety protocols for that. Same thing with your pumps. Clean all the chemical out of your chemical pumps. Um, and, and again, making sure you're following all your safety protocols. If you have a service system in place for your chemical pumps, um, for me, I like to take mine off the wall. I take them down to our maintenance shop and they kind of take them apart and give them the once over. Um, and then we take them to a warm storage area. Our, uh, a lot of pool pump rooms are not winterized, so you take your chemical pumps somewhere where they can be stored in a warm area for the winter. Um, and then the chemical injection ports. So here in this bottom picture, the ports where the chemical lines get injected into your return line to the pool. A lot of times you can get uh, buildup, um, especially on your chlorine lines, can get uh, buildup, uh, hard calcium, uh, like build up on those. It's a good time to take those apart, get those all cleaned out, and, uh, and again, ready to go for next year. Your pool heaters, if your pools have heaters, if you're lucky enough to have that, you want to have, uh, make sure that they get serviced. Um, you want to drain any water out of the pool heaters. Um, your filters should be cleaned or backwashed uh, before you're done with them for the year, and then you want to drain everything out of the filters. Um, your, your filters, a lot of times you'll have these um, pressure gauges on your filter here. You want to make sure you drain the water out of those fil filter pressure gauge lines. Any valves that you have in the pool, you don't want to have water laying anywhere, so you want to have all your valves open. If you have pneumatic filters like the Defenders, then you're also going to want to reverse the air pressure on those to open all those valves up. Make sure all the water gets drained down completely out of all of your piping, all of your fittings, all of your lines. Um, your pumps should have a drain plug on the bottom. You want to remove those to get all the water out of the pump volume. Um, your strainer baskets should have a drain plug. Drain the water out of your strainer baskets. You want to clean all your strainer baskets. Nothing, nothing, nothing is worse than coming back in and finding nine-month-old strainer baskets still full from last year. So. Again, if your goal is to be as e make your spring as easy as possible, get everything cleaned up as best you can uh, before, you get, before you get out of there. Your UV units, 
Um, if you have them, again, you want to service them, drain them, make sure they're ready to go. You know, check the bulb life, check the bulb intensity, make sure the, the um, bulb cleaner um, or the wiper is working well. Um, so any service that you need to do on them. You want to drain those units out for the winter then. Your chemical controllers, you're going to want to make sure that they get uh, any service, any winter maintenance or service you do on your controllers gets taken care of. The flow cells, so in this picture here where the water flows through the flow cell, you want to drain um, the water out of the flow cells and the tubing that goes to and from your pool. That's a one easy place for water to lay in. You can end up with some split lines. So you want to blow air through there and make sure you can drain uh, all the water out of the flow cell tubing as well as the cells themselves. Give your chemical probes a good clean. Um, again, follow your manufacturer's recommendation for this. Um, different probes have different cleaning protocols, so make sure whatever probes you're using, um, that you're, you're following uh, good, good practices with cleaning your chemical probes. And then you want to store them in distilled water so that you don't get any buildup on them over the winter. And then again, take them to a warm storage area. All of your makeup lines, um, you know, however you add water to your pool, you want to make sure you're um, draining water out of those lines. If you have any um, fittings or O-rings or cast iron threads, you want to grease or lube those all up. Again, you want to protect them for the winter. So you want to use a, you know, a good white lithium grease or a, a um, lube tube or something like that to kind of give everything a good once over. Um, again, make sure your life in the spring is a little bit easier. This is a really good time too to check the bond wire system on your pumps and any of your equipment. Swimming pools, uh, all your pipes and fittings have a, uh, an innate, innate vibration to them. And the bond wire, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's this wire right here on this pump. You can see it on this pump back here. There's a bond wire on every metal fitting um, in your pump room. And over time, they can loosen because of the vibration. It's a good time to go through and make sure that those are all tightened up. Um, I don't know about your electrical inspector, but that's one of the things, you know, your three year swimming pool inspection, your inspector will come through and one of the things he checks is our bond wire system to make sure everything is snugged down. So um, winter and spring are two good times to check that bond wire system on all your equipment. Um, your pumps and any other necessary equipment, anywhere where you have water that might lay, you want to loosen bolts on any connections to let that water drain out. And then again, if you have an air compressor in your pump room to drive your, if you have a defender system or any other pneumatic driven system, you're going to have water buildup in your air compressor. And uh, most air compressors on the very bottom of them have a little screw you can, un, uh, you can loosen up to drain water out of your air compressor for, uh, for the winter. So. Good. Any questions about the pump room? Anything in there? There was a comment from Dave on there that said uh, a good way to get chemical lines cleaned is to run water through the lines when the pool is still running. It will clean the lines better and prevent mineral buildup. Yep, thanks Dave for sharing that. That's actually exactly what I do. I usually run water through the lines, um, get them cleaned out and then run air through them um before i get winterized sometimes i'll even take all my fittings apart and soak them in cleaning vinegar um try to get all that white stuff off of the off especially my chlorine ports and stuff like that so there was a question that just came in should we remove flow meters for the winter i see uh, dave shaking his head setup, <laughs> yeah you don't have to you don't have to the, the only thing i'd caution some flow meters um, depending on how they're um, constructed, you can get some water that lays in them. So if, if you have the type that gets water that lays in there, make sure you at least get the water taken out. Um, but most of the like the digital or the readout flow meters, you do not need to take out um, for the winter. As long as, there's, as long as you can drain the lines down completely, you're good with that. So good. Any other questions about the pump room before we move on here? Good questions, thanks. Keep them coming if you have. I know everybody's facility is a little different, so. 
All right, on your pool body, um, again, understand where you want to end up. By the time you're done winterizing, where do you want to end up? So for example, are you going to leave your pool empty or full? You know, some pools are made to be left empty, some pools are made to be left full. If you have a, uh, typically if you have a plaster finish, you want to leave it full of water. You want that plaster to stay wet all winter. Um, but again, follow your manufacturer's recommendations uh, or the contractor's recommendations from when you uh, had your pool built. Are you going to leave it covered or uncovered? Um, if you're going to cover it, make sure you really do a thorough job vacuuming and brushing the pool before you cover it. You want that pool really, really clean as, as best as possible before you put that cover on. Um, one of the things I like to do before I shut my heat off for the year is I take uh, at least one of my drain covers off. That makes it a lot easier to drain the pool. I can then when I'm, uh, you know, I'll use the pump to drain it most of the way down, but I usually have a submersible sump. I can drop it right down into that drain box. But if I'm, if I'm wading into nasty green water in the spring to try to find that drain cover to take it off, it's a pain in the butt. So for me, I'll put my scuba gear on and I'll go down and take those drain covers off before I turn my heat off so that they are ready to go um, for the spring. I already have it all done. Um, do you drain your pool for winterization? Um, some pools you need to, to drain them all the way down, especially if they have like a zero depth entry or you need to access some of the fittings. Um, you, you'll need to drain it down. And then once you're done, do you refill it or do you leave it empty? While you're down there, inspect your drain covers. You could have, you know, you want to inspect them for any cracks or breaks or deterioration. Um, over time, um, some of those plastic drain covers can break or get cracked. This is a good time, again, if you want to order something to be able to reopen next spring, now's the time you want to take a look at them uh, in case you need to reorder anything. The other thing you can check, and hear this one blow up of my drain cover here, check the date on it. You know, your Virginia Graham Baker compliance says that your drain covers cannot be more than 10 years old. Um, and they all must have a date on them um, when you install them. So if you're installing your drain covers, you put the date on them. So double check, again, make sure your drain covers are compliant for VGB. And here again, if you have this, this gives you eight or nine months to get things ordered for next spring. The other thing you want to uh, do with your pool body, you want to make sure if you're going to add any winter chemicals uh, or balance your water. Um, I am currently dealing with um, some issues with staining on the bottom of my pool, so I'm going to be looking at adding sequestering agents. Um, I'm going to be vacuuming it regularly to keep the leaves out. Um, but I also have been reading about the importance of that, you know, the balanced water uh, in terms of what what is sitting in there for eight or nine months? Getting your um, total alkalinity much higher can help with that staining as well. So make sure you're balanced. For me, I would also say go a little higher on your total alkalinity and calcium over the winter um, and add a sequestering agent if you need to. So whatever you need to add to your water to make sure you're in good shape for, again, uh, seven, eight, nine months, however long you're going to leave it full. You want to drain all the lines out or pump air through the lines. Um, again, especially anything that's a shallower line, you want to make sure that that's empty. Um, any return lines coming in, especially anything shallow, any drain lines or skimmer lines. And then, and then uh, knowing how your tank drains, do your lines drain to a surge tank um, or do they drain from the tank to the pump or, or how does that work? So the e example I have here is a, uh, um, you know, you have your pool or spa here, and then you've got a collection tank, the skimmers and the main drains all drain to that collection tank. So are you able to isolate, shut those valves, isolate those lines and drain everything and just pump out your collection tank and that essentially drains all your lines out. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, and then uh, I also will hook a, an air compressor hose up to my return lines and pump air out into my pool until I see air coming up, um, just to make sure all my return lines are, uh, are pumped out as well. 
again, you're, you're, the risk here is you really don't want a, a hard freeze getting down and breaking any of your lines. Also in your pool body, you want to winterize your skimmers. Um, again, most pools, when you, you should follow the recommendations for your pool, but in short, you want to drain all the water out of your skimmers, um, clean out your skimmer baskets, and then have some sort of plugs or freeze prevention equipment in there. That might or might not include putting antifreeze down into your uh, skimmers. If you have gutters, in general, you want to drain the water out of your gutters and then leave your pool level below the gutter bottom so you don't have that freeze and thaw pushing on your uh, gutters from the water that's in your water in your pool body. So good. Any questions about the pool body? Any issues? I've been talking with Dave occasionally about trying to keep the staining from my pool. I've been having some issues in, in a couple of my two of the pools that I manage with that and the common consensus seems to be keep the leaves out of it and uh, keep the alkalinity up, use a sequestering agent. So, um, but again, one, one thing that came to my mind as far as kind of chemistry, I know here in State College, the water is very hard. Does that create some kind of issues or is that just as simple of balancing it out with chemicals? Well, actually, swimming pools like hard water. So it, it's actually helpful that the pool, that the water's hard. Um, typically pool operators will add a calcium um, chloride to increase the hardness for the swimming pool. It, the equipment and shell does like harder water. Um, the other thing is the makeup water tends to be higher in alkalinity, which helps, but the rainwater is, is lower. So, you know, you can start off with a really high alkalinity and then that tends to dissipate over the course of winter. So um, having a solution for that and help in place helps too so and what about different areas of like snowfall and things then that come along with that because runoff and those kind of aspects are those certain things that you kind of just have to deal with from year to year or are there ways to uh, control that well you know it really depends on your setup hopefully you're not getting much runoff into your pool anyways um, you know you should be the deck should be sloping down away from the edge of the pool slightly so you don't have an issue with that. Um, the bigger issue I'm seeing is snowfall on pool covers um, and the stretching and movement of the pool covers. Some covers are porous, some, um, some are not, but having a solution in hand to how to get that either snowfall or water off of a pool cover to prevent the pool cover from getting damaged. So, but yeah. Dave, did you have something to add? I saw you had unmuted yourself. Hold on a sec, he says. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I had to get back to the unmute again. My, I got three screens up, and it's sometimes I lose the mouse. So um, <laughs> I was going to suggest, and I know we've talked about this before, but uh, one of the techniques I've changed over the years is I try if I'm going to keep water in the pool, which in all of our pools and most of them out this way we do, um, I run the pools as late as I possibly can to try and eliminate that spring startup. And, and keeping the leaves out so that they're not going to sit there and start to stay in the bottom of the pool or, you know, um, cause other problems, especially when we try to go to, to the startup in the spring. It keeps my drain lines clear. I don't have to do the draining if I don't want to, um, except for chemical balance. But keeping that pool up and running has been a huge bonus, much more than I anticipated, uh, both in saving me money. Uh, it keeps me up at the pool so I can notice things that are happening so you're not kind of walking away from it and forgetting about it, but the little bit of money that I have to spend on maintenance to be up there saves me a whole bunch of money in the spring. And uh, quite frankly, it's extending the life from my pool. Yeah, thanks for adding that. And that's one thing I actually forgot to put in here is yeah, if possible, I mean, run chlorine into your pool as late as you can. And that'll help to prevent a lot of that, you know, algae blooms or, uh, you know, or other problems you can have. You don't want things growing in your pool over winter. So if you can run it really late until you start getting some hard freezes, um, that'll actually really help your spring startup. So thanks for adding that, Dave. That was a really good point there. Um, along with I, that, I have- Todd, yes. sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Um, we normally drain our pool a few inches below the skimmers. We leave them full for the winter. Um, now then we end up with rain, snow, whatever. Would you recommend going lower 
to allow for that or continue to pump off as you get the extra precipitation? You know, it really depends on how easy it is for you to get in there and pump stuff off. Um, if it's really a pain and you know you get snowfall and then you can't get your gates open or you can't get doors open because you got six inches of snow blocking it, um, I would set yourself up a little better. Um, the, the danger about draining it down too low is, especially if you have a plaster finish, it's, it's a lot harder on the finish of your pool the more you drain out because um, you want that plaster to stay as wet as possible. So there is a little bit of a balancing act there between um, leaving enough in for, um, it, you know, to, to keep your plaster wet, keep some water in the pool, and draining enough out that you can absorb that rainfall and that snowfall. Um, so that's really kind of a very non-committal answer. <laughs> right, because I know we don't want to go down as low as if we, we do have an ice on the surface that they're going to hit the lights. Right. You want to keep right. it above the lights but below the skimmers. Right, yep. Yep. Yeah, I, you know, I, if you have a plaster finish and you have lights and stuff in there, I'd probably continue to pump it out if it gets a little too high. Um, seems to be, a, you know, better and you might have to chip through some ice to do that, but that's probably better maintenance in the long run if you're able to get in there and do it. Um, I do okay. know that once the snow falls and the ice hits, they can't even get into their pool because everything's frozen shut. But um, the other thing I, I would say too, uh, when you do drain your pools, whether you leave it empty or not, always remember to open those hydrostat release valves in the bottom of the pool. Um, uh, you, they, they should be in the drain box. There should be a little valve you can open so that if you do have groundwater pushing up on your pool, it will come out of that hydrostat valve rather than pushing your pool body up out of the water. If you want to see something really disturbing, just Google um, you know, pools rising out of the earth or something. And there's a lot of really uh, horrible for pool owner images of pools that have gotten pushed up out of the ground because of uh, failure to open those hydrostatic relief valves. So. But good. Any other questions about pool body? Again, good discussion. I hope, hope you guys are um, getting some help with this. So on your uh, pool deck, um, again, give your deck equipment a good inspection, see what you need to order for next year, and then make sure it gets stored uh, appropriately. Um, you know, it could be canopies, umbrellas, awnings, um, anything like that. Again, you want to confirm the good electrical bond connection on your ladders and railings. Our electrical inspector will go around and he'll rattle all of our railings, and if they're too loose in their socket, he'll tell me the, the connection's not, not that good. Um, so you can double check all of the fittings and, and sockets and everything on your ladders and railings and everything around the pool deck. Also, if you have a, a railing like the one that's shown in the picture here, if you're going to cover your pool, you need to get that stuff out of the water too. So um, you're going to want to get that out and out of the way. Um, yeah, so remove and store ladders and railings. Also, you want to inspect your deck joints. If you have any settling of your deck, um, any issues with your caulk coming out uh, or any structural issues, the picture uh, on the right side of the middle down here, um, it's kind of hard to see, but that's a big chunk of concrete came out of our pool deck. We're going to have to fix that before we reopen, um, but it was a good time for me to walk around and, and double check on that. Um, you want to make sure your electrical outlets all have proper GCFI protection and, and covers. Sometimes throughout the course of the summer, things get wet, things pop. We have, we have um, those outlets go bad. You know, again, if you need to replace anything, uh, you've got a couple of months off here, give, you, give your an electrician a chance to get in there and replace those outlets. Make sure they have good covers on so they're protected from the winter as well. Any freeze prone equipment you've got on your deck, uh, you wanna take it out and uh, take it to warm storage. So your AED, your test kits, anything that's freeze prone you want to take to warm storage. The other thing I'll caution you too is that these testing reagents, they go bad over time. Um, so, you know, usually it's a good chance, you know, if, if it's an open bottle, throw it away. If it's been sitting out in the sun, throw it away. Um, get new test reagents each year. Um, usually, again, kind of the best practices thing, they, they do go bad over time, so you want to make sure you have up-to-date reagents um, when you reopen next spring. 
Anything else on pool deck? Everybody good with that? Pretty straightforward. One, one other thing I'll add to pool deck is, uh, I don't know what the, the um, vandalism risk is at the pool you're at, but I'd say move your lifeguard chairs and other equipment away from the edge of your pool before you winterize. We've had issues every now and then. Kids think it's fun to hop the fence and then throw stuff in the pool. So if that's an issue for you, move all of your stuff further away from the pool, make it a, a more difficult target uh, for the winter. All right, specialized features and equipment. Um, so you're, again, all of these should have uh, manufacturer's guidelines or the installation contractor's guidelines for how to winterize them. Follow all of those protocols. In general, for water slides, you want to drain the water out of all the lines. You want to inspect, inspect the flume, do whatever your regular maintenance inspection or protocols are for the flume of the slide. And then anywhere that water might lay, you want to add some antifreeze in there. So for me, these are the ports where the water comes out. I'll put a little bit of antifreeze in there. Um, let them just kind of run down in lines just to make sure there's nothing in there. Usually the line's big enough that you're not going to have major problems, but um, better safe than sorry. Antifreeze is cheap, so put a little in there. Your spray grounds, um, any uh, fixtures that you have, you, know, you want to remove them, inspect them, and then store them for the winter, um, but get them out. Uh, any of the lines that you have, you want to drain water from the lines and then uh, blow air through. I just took a, an air compressor up to the pump in the pump room, the pump line in the pump room, and blow it all out, all the way from the pump room, all the way out to the spray ground. And then I open and close the valves and blow out one feature at a time until I, um, until I get everything out. You want to add antifreeze then to any of the features or fixtures anywhere where you might have water laying. Put some antifreeze in there and then plug the lines or or prevent water and moisture from getting back into the lines once you have that antifreeze in there. Um, climbing walls, um, you want to, if you have uh, any surfaces you want to clean, you also want to remove any buildup of anything on there. Inspect all of your grips and screws and everything, all of the um, structural function and structural pieces of your climbing wall. Um, and then any other standard recommended inspections you do on your climbing wall, you want to take care of that for the year. If you have any inflatable equipment, um, clean everything off, remove any buildup that might be there. Um, you want to either deflate them or leave them partially inflated. You, want to, you do want to prevent, preserve their shape and prevent cracking um, and then protect them from rodents. So I'll give you one quick story. Our Wibbit, I had it stored the very first winter I stored it. I left them folded up in their bags. And of course, when I uh, got them back out in the spring, half of them were cracked and had big crease lines on them and stuff. So now I leave them partially inflated to preserve their shape. Um, the second winter I stored them, I had a, a, some sort of rodent, chipmunk, mouse, something, built a nest uh, in between two of the Wibbit pieces and chewed through, uh, put about a hole about the size of a quarter in one of the, the pieces. So since then, I get some mothballs or rodent deterrent to put around my Wibbit pieces. So um, again, just kind of protecting all your, all your stuff. Uh, there was a question that came in from Dave. There's, uh, you know, what kind of product do you use for cleaning or process do you use for cleaning like climbing walls and the inflatables and things? Yeah, it depends on, it's, for me, it depends on the buildup I'm getting. So either a, a bleach solution or an alkali solution to start um, and then kind of seeing what, which one works best to get off whatever stain or residue I'm using. Um, so, you know, some of that stuff, you just have to be careful, especially like on the inflatables. You don't want it to um, degrade the inflatables or stain your inflatable, that rubber. And on the climbing wall, you don't want to end up with too much discoloration. So like with anything, I'll start with a, a lighter solution and get a little heavier and a little heavier until I find a good mixture that works. But uh, I mean, when in doubt, acid washing works on everything. You just got to be really careful and really rinse it off well when you're done. So um, cleaning vinegar, I will say cleaning vinegar has worked for me because it is a pretty, it's not as, 
um, volatile as a muriatic acid. The pH is like 10, or, or I'm sorry, is like um, three or four instead of one. So it's like an already diluted acid to use cleaning vinegar. And it, you know, you can buy it by the gallon and use that. So that seems to work pretty well. But again, rinse everything off um, real well. Um, and speaking of, well, I'll talk about it when I get into the bathhouses. But. Thanks, Todd. Yep. Any other questions about uh, specialized equipment? All right, into the bathhouse. Um, in general, again, every bathhouse is a little bit different. In general, shut off your water supply. And, and I'm assuming here that you have a bathhouse that needs to be winterized. Some bathhouses do, some don't. Um, but in general, shut off your water supply. You want to drain all the water lines, including your water heaters, your fixtures, and any other equipment that you have. You want to drain the water lines all the way down. Blow air through all of your water lines. Get them all cleaned out. Disassemble your faucets, your toilets, any, any other fixtures that, again, where water might lay, you want to disassemble everything. And then you want to add antifreeze anywhere where water might lay. This might be in, in drain traps. It might be inside the toilets, inside your faucet fixtures. Now, I say all this. I will, I'll have to report back to you in, in next spring when we open. We did something brand new here at Center Region Parks this year. Up on the top, the top picture on your screen there, this is a device that our parks maintenance guys built. And it's got a hose fitting on one end, like for a garden hose, and it's got an air fitting on the other end. And what we did is it, um, we used a funnel and we filled this whole thing with antifreeze. And then using the hose fitting, we put it on our water line just past the backflow preventer, put an air hose on the other side, and then we shot antifreeze through all of our bathhouse lines. And we filled this up four or five times until we ran antifreeze out of our showers, toilets, and sinks. And so we did everything else. We drained the water out, we blew air through, and then we used this device to blow antifreeze through all the lines. And so now the hope is we don't have to actually take apart all of the faucets, toilet fixtures, and everything else because everything should be full of antifreeze. Um, so that's our hope to not have to disassemble everything. Um, now I'll still put antifreeze down to some of the traps and stuff like that, but thought that was a pretty neat device. Um, hopefully it'll save because in the spring then we'll just have to put the backflow preventers back in, turn the water on and flush lines out. And then, uh, uh, hopefully we'll be good to go. The bottom picture here, this is a, an air hose fitting um, put on a quarter inch line. I have um, quarter inch um, threaded fittings on all of my pool pumps and equipment. Um, and so what I do is I just move this little fitting from, from pump to pump to pump all of our uh, pool pumps and stuff out, um, blow all the lines out and everything like that. So again, right tool for the right job, but just put that in there. So. Um, any uh, connections where water might lay, you want to disconnect. Um, any valves uh, you want to remove and store. So this is the inside of one of my MDF drinking fountains. We take all the valves out and store them. Any bladder tank, temperature mixture fitting, any other specialty equipment you might have, you want to make sure all the water is drained out of there. Uh, and then you look, you're looking for plugs. Any drain down plugs, backflow preventers. Um, Anything like that, any other specialty equipment you want to remove, any of that, take it to warm storage if needed. Um, make sure you label everything before you get it too far away from where, it's, where it lives most of the time. Again, if you're trying to make your spring as easy as possible, you don't want to be second guessing which plug went where, which fitting went where. Um, it's easy to put a little label on everything. Take a Sharpie or a label maker and just label it. Makes it super easy to do. And then again, before you get out of there for the winter, you wanna inspect all of your plumbing and electrical equipment. See if there's any deterioration or repair. You know, Do you have anything that needs to be repaired? Uh, get that scheduled for uh, the fall or the spring as, as possible. Um, again, take advantage of having a couple of months off. Any questions about the bathhouse? 
you find certain things create more problems for you on an annual basis? Like, you know, the, for example, different types of piping and at older facilities may have, you know, older metal and things like that, whereas newer facilities may have gone to the PVC or something like that. Are there kind of issues that you find that try not to do this? Yeah, so um, the, the couple issues that I've had, one was we had um, a building where all the piping was in the, the ceiling and suspended by hangers. And we had a hanger break. And every year for like three years in a row, we were getting water in this line and we're trying to figure out where is this coming from? Cause we were draining everything out, we we're blowing it out. And it ended up just being a low spot cause this hanger broke in the ceiling. Um, so I would just say double checking the lines to make sure that everything is draining down all the way down. Um, I also would say when possible, I, I know I said have a checklist, also get a second set of eyes. I have one of our, we have a maintenance crew and I have one of them come and help me every year. I do all this and then I just have him come and double check me just to get a second set of eyes on it. Um, and usually I have gotten everything, but sometimes he's like, oh, you forgot to do this. And I'm like, oh crap, yeah, I did. So um, getting a second set of eyes will help. The other thing I would say is look at your fixtures. There are some fixtures, um, we had a, a faucet fixture that was in all of our faucets that um, even though we blew the lines out, there was one place inside the, the fixture where water was laying. And every now and then we would, it would split and open if there was a little too much water. So now we, again, run antifreeze through it or take it apart and put some antifreeze in. And then the last thing I would say, just from personal experience, um, is waterless urinals. Um, we have our waterless urinals, you know, there's a, um, a fluid you put in to make them work, but um, the pH of urine is usually pretty high. And for whatever reason, over when we're closed for six or seven months and there's nothing flushing that out, um, we were having issues with that. So now I'm putting, um, again, some cleaning vinegar in there, low pH and flushing them out real well. And then I'll put the antifreeze in, which is a high pH also, but putting that, uh, the opposite pH cleaning material in there to clean it out first just seemed to really help with those. So hope that answers that question. And you, know, you mentioned an extra set of eyes. Do you mainly do all of this maintenance in house or are there certain aspects that perhaps you would recommend, you know, even amenities and things to get an outside agency to come in and do it for either warranty purposes or any of those kind of aspects? To me, that's a, a function of time, really. For me, you know, that, that's my job, so I make the time to do it. Um, if, if you have full-time staff and that's their job, I would say I would do as much as possible if you can because you're going to pay more for somebody to, to come, else to come in and do it. Um, other, you know, a contractor, whoever, you know, pool company, they're going to charge you more than it would cost you in your own time. Now, that being said, um, if you don't have full-time staff, it's absolutely worthwhile looking into a pool management company to do winterization tasks for you. Um, just, just to make sure that, you know, again, they're the experts, especially if they're gonna sign off on, on any liability for it. Um, you know, if you have a broken pipe or anything like that, to get somebody else to do that when you're not able to is absolutely worthwhile. And I know there, you know, there's a private pool here in our town that has a company that comes in and winterizes for them same company comes back in the spring and gets everything drained out, cleaned up, and ready to go. But it's a private pool run by volunteers, and so for them, it's worth it. They, they add a little more to their uh, membership dues, and that pays for that, that maintenance. So, Did anything else on that? All right, uh, just some in general things that are, I think, a good thing to do in the winter Weekly, this is my winter weekly tasks. Number one, just do a walkthrough. You know, you never know what you're gonna find, whether you've got a groundhog floating in your pool or uh, kids have jumped the fence and done damage to something. Whatever it is, um, the, if you can do a once a week facility walkthrough, then you're usually not surprised come March, you know, if it's been three months since you've been in there, sometimes you find things, you're like, crap, how long has that been there? Um, but if you're in there once a week, at least looking at stuff, 
um, usually a good good way to keep keep ahead of stuff. Um, spin your pumps. This is a recommendation. We had a couple pumps go bad a couple years in a row. The bearings went bad, and the uh, actually the guy that was rebuilding me said once a week go through and just spin them either by hand or just turn the switch on and off quick to just make sure they're all spinning. Um, once a week, spin all your pumps. Make sure that they're running. Um, that'll help prevent that corrosion buildup, whatever it is on the bearings and down in the pumps. And every pump's a little different, but always a good idea to, to keep them functional. If you have any other maintenance procedures that you, that you do, again, you know, if, you, if you've got, you know, got gaskets that need to be lubricated or um, anything else you want to double check on while you're in there, have a checklist. Hey, every week I go through, walk through, and I just check all these things off. Um, if you have any equipment fixtures um, that you want to do winter, winter maintenance on, again, you've got six, seven, eight months uh, here of no use, here's a perfect time to do any of that winter maintenance. You know, for me, the big one is the chemical, uh, chemical pumps. Great time to get them taken completely apart, rebuilt, and ready to go for the next year or so. Anything that, you, that can take some time and, and, and you can take them to an indoor space and do some maintenance on, is a good chance to do all that right now. All right, just some, some final, um, final thoughts here. Check all of your safety equipment every year for wear and cracks. I like to do it both in the winter when we're closing up, because if I need to order a new mask or a new respirator or new gloves, now's the time I wanna know I need to order that so I can order it and have it ready to go in the spring. I also check it in the spring before I get everything out for, this, for the summer to make sure that it's all ready to go. So check all your safety equipment every year. When you're de-winterizing in the spring, again, double check all your plugs, all your winterization equipment. If there's anything that needs to be replaced, replace your winterization equipment over the summer so that you're ready to go, you know, in October, November when you're going to winterize everything. Um, I'm a big believer in, in uh, working ahead, plan out, so, you know, a couple months in advance so you have the time to get the stuff in. I know we're, we're getting complacent with Amazon. You can get just about anything with two, on two-day delivery, but some, some stuff, if it's a little more complicated, you might have trouble finding it. Give yourself some time to find it. If you're adding chemicals to your pool, don't add different chemicals all at the same time. Um, for example, some algicides, if you're using an algicide, some of them and some of your chlorine shocks, they might have an adverse reaction if you're adding them at the same time. You've got six months to work with here. Add your algicides on one day, your chlorine shock on a different day. Um, add your sodium bicarb on one day, add your calcium chloride on a different day. Um, so take your time with it. Don't, add, don't just throw it all in on one day and turn, turn the lights off and leave. Um, make sure everything gets a chance to circulate in there and work its way around your shell. Um, if you have a vinyl liner or a vinyl pool, do not use a chlorine floater or leave a chlorine floater in there. Vinyl liners can be damaged with that, so just be aware of that as you're winterizing. Remember your pH of your antifreeze. If you're using antifreeze for a bunch of stuff, it's going to have a higher pH, typically between 8.5 and, and 10.5. So if you're using antifreeze anywhere where that's going to be an issue, again, some chlorine products have a lower pH. Um, other cleaning products might have a lower pH. Just be aware of any reaction you might get with, your, with using antifreeze with that. Um, and then I'll say duct tape is cheap. Antifreeze is cheap. Repairs are not. So when in doubt, throw a little antifreeze in there. When in doubt, put some duct tape on there. Seal that up real good. Um, using that stuff will make your life a lot easier in the long run. Um, you know, digging up and repairing a line is, is a costly, uh, not just in terms of dollars, but also in time. Sometimes we're really under the gun in the spring to get everything uh, open back up. And if you've got to put a big hold on it because you've got a broken line somewhere, um, when you could have just spent a little extra money on a gallon of antifreeze or a roll of duct tape, um, that's an easy choice for me to make. So. Good, any other comments, questions, or anything? From anybody? 
as far as your uh, checklists, you know, what form of those checklists? Are they just paper-based or do you have them in a spreadsheet set up or what does that look like? What are, what are your practices for those checklists? Uh, so right now it, it's just a, like a five page paper checklist. Um, for me personally, I like walking around the pool and being able to check stuff off. However, the fact that I am losing my checklist now, I put it down somewhere and can't remember where I put it, I am looking at digital solutions for that where something I could either put on my phone or on an iPad where I could check things off on there. Um, I, I'm too lazy though right now to, to, I haven't found something where I can take my five page checklist and just import it right to um, something on my phone that I can use. Um, but that might be a project I have in the future where I can you know, pull up a checklist on my phone and just check stuff off as I go. Um, there are some pool companies out there that do offer digital solutions for this. Um, so there are some things you can look at um, for that. So they, they do exist. They are out there. Pool management companies as well as swimming pool um, contractors and um, designers, uh, I know, are, are working with um, some digital technology to be able to do that. So, But for me personally, it's a paper list. One solution that I, I used to use when I was operating at the student union, there's a, a web-based tool that you also can put on your phone. It's called Trello, and it has multiple reasons to use it, but uh, one of the simplest functions is making those checklists. And if you do have that in a typed up format already, or simply just type it into a Word document, it is a, as easy as copy paste and it creates those lists for you. So. Um, maybe we can go over. I'm actually putting together a video on how to use that. Um, so that might be something that would be a real quick solution for you, and it's free. Perfect. Music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about your, you say, have storage systems organized, and what kind of system do you have to keep things organized? Is it just duct tape and a magic marker, or are there a little <laughs> bit more color coding systems or something else? Uh, I use bins. So I've got a bin with all of my tot pool plugs and equipment. I've got a bin with all of my um, fittings for everything. And I'm actually moving away from that and towards five gallon buckets. So I'm going to, uh, cause they're easier to store and, and they're easy to carry around. I had a contractor doing work for me and he, you know, I, you expect these contractors to show up with these complicated tool kits and all this. He had a five gallon bucket with a tool apron draped over it and, and that he had everything he needed in there and it was easy to carry around and it was cheap. I was like, well, that's perfect. I'm going to use that. So now I'm, I'm moving everything over to five gallon buckets, all of my plugs, fittings and everything. It's in a five gallon bucket. I can pick it up and carry it right down into the pool shell with me. Makes it super easy. And then I just label the buckets uh, either with a Sharpie or a, a you know, label maker. And then same thing with all my plugs. I, I try to keep them labeled or numbered um, to match my checklist system so that um, everything's good. And then on my checklist itself, I have notes on there about, you know, um, you know for this pool, all, all of the lines drain, drain down to this drain box. So if I'm draining everything out, I know exactly where it drains down to. Um, or this, this feature, all of these lines drain back to the pump room. Um, so just having those notes in there about how everything drains and how everything kind of works, um, prevents, then I don't have to go back and look at the as builts every year. So good. And any other questions from anyone else? Well, good. Thank you all for joining us. BK, what, I know you've got some closing stuff here. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, some folks have signed up to, for the CEU process, so I will uh, put a holding slide up with that link uh, to a survey monkey, so that way you can take the quiz and get your CEU credits for the uh, participation today, as well as I just want to thank everyone for taking part today. Um, we've been plugging away at the virtual world since COVID has kind of changed our realities and senses of uh, how we were gonna be moving forward. But it's uh, very nice to see we're getting a, uh, a broader audience taking it this way than trying to do everything in person. So 
we definitely will continue with this, but we are going to also uh, try to have in-person events once again uh, when we get the clearing and PRPS moves forward with that model. Um, we will be closing out you know, the rest of the year here. Actually, Thursday, we're going to be having a turf event, putting our fields to bed. So kind of going along with the winterization process. Uh, and we will be having a, a park maintenance round table on the 22nd of October as well. Uh, moving into November, uh, PRPS will, of course, be having their fall membership meeting. And the park resource branch will be holding two events uh, the first two Thursdays. And then as we move into December, uh, we'll be starting to focus a bit more on some sustainability aspects. And so uh, looking at uh, green infrastructure and looking at how we can be more sustainable in our maintenance efforts and moving forward. Uh, it's a big push, not only nationally, but specifically DCNR is looking heavily into that in their rec plan for the next couple of years. Um, if you have not had the chance, please check out our website. Um, we have gone to the subscription model now, and so there are still things, teasers out there to check out, but um, we are trying to move towards that self-support, so we're looking for your support. And reach out to me. Please let me know questions you may have, uh, suggestions we can put together, like digital checklists and options and things that we can put out there. Um, that is my background is in creating solutions for people. So uh, let me share my screen here. And so here is, oh, minimize this. Can you see that link there? I'll also put this link in the text box so that folks can have aspect to that as well. Um, again, thank you, Todd, for your expertise and sharing your best practices with us. Um, hopefully, we can get you to come back in the spring and um, help us reopen everything as we move <laughs> forward. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Again, please reach out. Uh, this will be recorded, so if you missed anything as we moved along, uh, I will have that up there. And for the time being, thanks for participating and have a wonderful day. Thanks, BK. All right, looks like we got most out. Well, thanks, Todd. I appreciate your help. Yep. I thought that went quite well. I I had a question. You know, I see all that grass in the background of your picture there. Are there some considerations that, uh, you know, grounds management that move along that kind of impact your operations, or is that mainly managed by someone else? Uh, our parks maintenance guys take care of most of that. The biggest thing is keeping the leaves out of the pool. So um, working with them to make sure they can have access to, uh, to do the leaf collection regularly to keep them from, from blowing in over the winter. So that's really the main part of it. And that's just because of staining of the, you know, the concrete yeah. in the bottom of the pool and those things, or is it more a chemistry thing? Uh, the staining is a big part of it and the chem chemistry is a little part of it, but the biggest pain is I've got to clean it all out in the spring. So not like forkfuls of sopping wet leaves <laughs> in, the, in the spring, I've got to get down there. I shovel all that out myself. So the more we can keep out of there, the, the better. And you cover the entire, your pool areas and all of your pools or no? I don't, no, no. I don't have covers for our pools. So whatever blows in, blows in. Is that a, is that a choice or is that kind of, you found that the covers create more of a, challenge because of weather and leaves and those kind of things uh, no, 
one, they're expensive. Number two, to get them on and off is a huge pain. And we used to cover them. Uh, the old pools we had, we had covers. And we didn't see much of a difference in covering versus not covering. And so it was one of those like, well, why bother? Um, but then you also have to find a place to store the cover. You've right. got this enormous cover you take off the pool and if you don't have anywhere to put it, um, you, you know, it, that can be a challenge too. So um, yeah, we didn't, I didn't notice much of a difference when we covered, did not cover. So. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, thank you again for your time. Yeah. Um, and uh, this will all, I'm going to turn this into a uh, podcast as well, so people can listen to the broadcast if they don't have the time to sit down and watch it. Okay. Sounds good, man. Well, I look forward to working with you again. again. All right. Take care. Have a good one.